Hi, everybody. Um, we are going to get started right on time. Uh, maybe we'll wait for a second. No, we'll just get started. Okay, welcome to our October webinar, Visible Light Communication and Applications in Smart Grids with Dr. Shaw from uh, New Mexico Tech. Uh, I'm Brittany Vandwerf, the Communication and Outreach Specialist from uh, for New Mexico EPSCoR, and that's the established program to stimulate competitive research. EPSCoR is a nationwide program funded by the National Science Foundation, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, along with Dustin Allen, our systems and network analyst, who will be behind the scenes, uh, making sure everything goes smoothly. All right. Oh, no, not yet. Okay, so um, a few housekeeping things. Before I begin, uh, if you have any questions at any point, please type them into the Q&A box and Dustin will politely but firmly interrupt Dr. Shaw uh, and read them out loud. I also want to let you know this will be the last webinar of our 2021 series. We will be back with more fabulous webinars in January 2022 and information about those and uh, that lineup will be available in late December probably on our website and in the monthly New Mexico EPSCO newsletter. So, right, with that, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Dr. Shaw received a BS, his BS degree in electrical engineering from South China University of Technology in 2011, an MS degree in electrical engineering from Hong Kong Polytechnic Institute in 2012, and a PhD degree in electrical engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology in 2018. He obtained the Hashimoto Prize for Best Doctoral Dissertation. And he's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at New Mexico Tech. He is also a faculty hire with the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. Uh, his research areas involve wireless communication and networking with primary interest in visible light communication and positioning. Uh, his current research efforts focus on retroreflective visible light communication, reinforcement, and deep learning in intelligent reflecting surface aided wireless network and ultra low power backscatter communication. Uh, I'm so glad you're here to explain what all of that means. Uh, thank you so much for your time and please begin whenever you're ready. So thank you very much, Brittany, for uh, introducing me and good afternoon, everybody. Let me now share my screen and start the presentation. So can you see the full screen of my uh, PowerPoint? Okay. And my sound is also clear, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about a pretty new term, uh, probably new to everybody the visible light communication and its applications in the smart grid project. Here is the outline. First of all, I would like to talk about why smart grids need new wireless access, uh, access technologies. Without new wireless access talk, uh, technologies, what problem it will encounter? And as a new wireless access technologies, the visible light communication can offload the data traffic from the conventional radio access. For example, your home Wi-Fi router, uh, the cellular network, 4G, 5G. And also the visible light communication can secure the wireless communication between the smart uh, appliances, the IoT sensors, and the gateway. Compared to a conventional visible light communication, the retro visible light communication is uh, actually um, a further step for the VLC. Uh, use some uh, reflection instead of generating the optical signal and could be a better solution uh, in some case. And also this retro VLC supports uh, accurate real-time tracking that can probably will be very beneficial in the future automation system. When the automation system is included in the uh, smart grid control, then you would better to know the real-time position of those uh, like the robots, the UAVs. Okay, first let's look at what are smart grids or smart microgrids supposed to do? 
This is one sentence from the uh, smart grid book. As a subset of smart grids, smart microgrids operate in grid connected mode and offer the benefits of distributed computing and communications to deliver real time, real time information and enable instantaneous balancing of electrical supply and demand at the level required for each discrete device. So real time instantaneous balancing and each discrete device are the essential features in the smart microgrid. For example, your laptop requires um, 100 watt. Your refrigerator requires a thousand watt. When you have an issue with uh, the power supply, which one you want to turn it off? You don't want to turn the refrigerator off, right? You want to turn your laptop off or you turn your desktop off. So this instantaneous balancing need the real-time information collection to help the energy management operation to make the instantaneous decision in a smart way. In the home area network, the smart grid can deliver the electricity to loads on a targeted as needed basis. And the microgrids will do the custom uh, diagnostic to do the load shedding and level demand in real time. You have many, many devices in your home, like smart appliances, IoT sensors, and other electrical devices like the electrical vehicles. You want them to adjust their run schedule to reduce the electricity demand on the grid at critical times, and that can significantly reduce your energy bill. The refrigerator and the desktop is one very essential example, I think, to uh, show the importance of the load shedding. Typically, the home apply smart appliances can be characterized in three categories, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is the most sensitive one, and you don't want to uh, the tier one load to be disconnected or uh, to lose the power at any time, like the elevator, like the emergency light. Part of the uh, appliances you might consider the disconnection sometime, even for a refrigerator, like disconnected for an hour will not make your life much harder. Some devices we can disconnect it for a long time, for example, the fans. And some appliances, uh, their tier level may depend on their, uh, depend on the season. For example, thermostats, AC conditioner. This type of devices, they are not that uh, severe to be disconnected in let's say early uh, or mid spring or mid autumn, but they will give you very hard time if you disconnect your AC conditioner in the mid summer. So in order to collect this information in real time and have the um, best control over all this energy usage, we want a new wireless technology that can give these five features simultaneously. They needs to be reliable, even though uh, uh, they, they needs to be reliable, they needs to be secure, protect your data exchange between you, between the smart appliances and the uh, energy management, management operator. And they need to be ubiquitous because you have the appliances everywhere. They need to have low latency to guarantee the real time data collection. And they also want to be energy efficient because you don't want to create something that is costing you a much additional energy to do some energy management, right? Okay, so given this, all these five features, let's look at how our wireless technology evolved from the 20 years ago to the current one. 20 years ago, we are using the GPRS that's supporting the basic phone call, short message services, multimedia message services, and it talks, takes 36 hours to download a one gigabyte HD video. Back to now, in the 5G communication network, it only takes 0.8 seconds. And in the 5G network, we have three highlighted features. The massive connections, we want to satisfy the IoT, the Internet of Things requirement to connect everything. Of course, in the smart grid, we care more about the electrical devices. And we want to achieve ultra low latency. The specification is lower than five milliseconds between the communication of a device and the cellular tower. The third one is the ultra high speed. 
that's uh, something around 10 gigabit per second, although is this is, uh, um, we know that even though for the uh, Verizon, the 5G uh, network provided by the Verizon uh, T-Mobile, they cannot go to that high speed, right? So actually the current 5G is not, uh, I, from my understanding, it's not a complete 5G yet. It utilizes some additional bandwidth, like in this figure, it utilizes some additional bandwidth in the 5G primary band, but it's still lower than six gigahertz. The very challenging part in 5G is the green part, which is here. Why it's challenging? Because this type of signal deteriorates really fast and it's very hard for them to penetrate like the concrete wall. Therefore, the indoor communication becomes a huge challenge to the cellular uh, tower if they are going to apply the signal here, which we call it millimeter wave. This is the trend of the wireless technology evolution. We keep exploring the higher frequency uh, spectrum to allow more connection to provide lower latency, to provide higher speed. Then what's next after the 5G? Maybe visible light could be a solution, which is happening at the terahertz level. What can actually visible light provide us? There are many advantages for it. High security, you can only sense the signal inside of your room. No RFEMI, the electromagnetic interference. So it can be applied in some places, for example, the hospital. It has no interference to the, uh, to the clinic equipment. Or some places like very sensitive to the RF signals, like the underground mining. And also VLC is ubiquitous. Where you have illumination, you can utilize the light to do the visible light communication. It can achieve the high data rate once it applied the MIMO technique. And it's a green technology because in addition to the power you cost to do the illumination, it only costs you a little bit amount more to enable the communication. And finally, the high location accuracy is a benefit uh, result from the dominant line of sight of the visible light signal. Uh, you have some reflection from the wall, from the objects, from the obstacles, but compared to the link between the light source and your optical sensor, those reflections are probably the, the very accurate estimation, 3% of the line of sight. So they, can, they are not even strong enough to create an interference. That's the reason why we get the very high location accuracy. So here we show a typical VLC system diagram to better understand what is the visible light communication instead of just showing a light bulb there. So the light bulb is a emitter, the LED emitter. Then behind the emitter, we have the dimming control that satisfy the illumination required level. A data control send the 0101 bit sequence into the driver circuit. And finally, the driver circuit including the dimming control and the data you are going to transmit and generate a raw signal, a current signal driving the LED. So the LED transform the electrical signal into optic signal and send into the air. In the air, your signal is fluctuating very quickly. And this very quickly fluctuating signal is imperceptible to human uh, eyes. So that eliminates the concern that you are turning the light on and off and it will cause the blinking. Any blinking that has the frequency higher than 60 giga, uh, 60 hertz, 60 hertz means you uh, turn on and off the uh, light at a frequency above 60 hertz, you typically cannot see the blinking at all. That's, uh, that is done by experiment, I test it. And this optical signal, once it's received by the photodiode, the PD, it will include some noise in it. The noise comes from the circuit, comes from the, uh, the ambient light. And this noise will accumulate with the signal and got amplified by this TIA, 
a trans impedance amplifier typically used to amplify the optical signal and transform into an electrical signal. So that's the entire typical way how we use a light bulb to transmit signal and carry data. When we integrate the VLC into the smart grid home area network, there are twofold benefits. Let's consider now we have uh, some appliances like the washing machine, the electrical vehicle, a desktop. We want to connect these devices all to a same gateway, a wireless gateway. It can be a Wi-Fi. And this gateway is interfaced with the AMI, the advanced metering infrastructure to control the power, uh, to control the energy usage. This, because you are connecting all the appliances to just a single gateway, therefore the, latent, the, the, the wireless channel is pretty congested and in such a way the latency goes up. In the worst case, the connection will not even be able to maintain, means that you send the data, the data will be just keep failing, keep failing, keep failing, and then you, your, your channel is disconnected. How we can uh, solve this issue? We can apply a, a visible light communication to offload some of the data to the light access point. And then the wireless channel for the radio will be less congested and the latency will go down. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit, consider a hacker that is outside your room trying to intercept your wireless signal they can intercept the, wi the Wi-Fi one or the radio frequency one, but they cannot intercept the visible light one. So that is a protection uh, that enabled by the visible light communication channel of the data communication. So based on this feature, we can consider using the VLC link to do sensitive data exchange, for example, the key exchange and the mutual authentication while leave the conventional radio frequency link to do the encrypted data communication that is more bulky. For example, the video data segment, the audio data segment. So next we will explain this twofold benefit separately. The first one we are going to introduce is the offloading, how VLC offloads the data. If we want to offload the data using the VLC link, we first need to connect the VLC to the internet, right? And one essential problem of the conventional VLC is the uplink. Your desktop does not have a light bulb to transmit the optical signal back to the ceiling light. Your uh, printer also does not have an LED emitter to shoot an uplink optical signal. So how can we resolve this uplink challenge of the duplex VLC? Incorporating a conventional radio frequency uplink could be a solution. So this uh, a schematic way, we can use a duplex Wi-Fi link to connect your Wi-Fi access point with your laptop. And the visible light only provides the unidirectional downlink. Now we use a diagram to explain the traffic flow of this setting. We call it asymmetric Li-Fi Wi-Fi system. Li-Fi is another term for uh, visible light communication. It's coming from the University of Edinburgh, uh, Dr. Hess. He proposed this Li-Fi term back to 2012 in the TED, in the TED presentation. So asymmetric Li-Fi Wi-Fi system. We have a client, which is the PC2. That This one is going to connect to the internet. PC1 is the one that is uh, driving the light source. We use a uh, software to, uh, to drive the light source. And the, the packets, first of all, the packets going, is going out from the PC2, the client, which is the, this blue one. And then the packets will pass through the access point and reach to the remote server located in the internet. The remote server remote, uh, replied from the internet goes back to the Wi-Fi router. And here, now the tricky part occurs. This packets should be going to the PC2 based on your conventional setting. However, we change the routing table in the wireless access point to reroute the packets to the PC1, which is the relay machine. And then the packets will flow through the uh, wireless 
VLC channel, and finally arrives the uh, PC2 client. So in such a way, we can use the downlink VLC and the downlink VLC and the uplink Wi-Fi in an asymmetric way. Next, I'm going to show you the test bed based on this design, this diagram design. So we have this desktop as a client. We have this laptop as the controller for the software defined VLC. And we have this LED board as the light source. We have this uh, Saw Lab photo detector as the receiver. Next, please watch our video. Hello everyone. Here is the experiment devices of the SDVLC software defined visible light communication. And uh, you can see here is two computers. This one acts as the client and this one acts as the relaying machine. Here is two peripheral devices, which is the USRPs. This device is the um, photo detector, which is the VC receiver in the VLC channel, and this board will generate the LED light, carry the signal. Okay, and now let's open a website uh, in the client. For example, we type in the youtube.com and then click on the enter button. Okay, you see the website show up here. And now what I'm going to do is shade the light. Use this hand to shade the light and at the same time, I try to open the Google website here. Click on the button, and we see there is no reflect, no response. Okay, now I move my hand away, and let's see the client. Now the website show up. And that's the visible light communication connect to internet. Thank you very much. So in this uh, video, we see that we use the unidirectional VLC to connect to the internet and the uplink is actually using a Wi-Fi from the client. So it can actually uh, uh, implement such a system. Now we are looking at a um, broad view of how we integrate this uh, hybrid Li-Fi Wi-Fi into a heterogeneous network, HANET. The coexistence of Li-Fi Wi-Fi leverage ubiquitous the Li-Fi illuminators to alleviate the wireless radio channel congestion and provide a better quality of experience to the end users. Look in this room. This lady is holding a phone very close to the Wi-Fi. His signal, her signal is very good. So he, she can use actually the Wi-Fi to communicate very well. While this lady here using this laptop has a very low signal stress over the Wi-Fi. If she also wants to use the Wi-Fi to transmit like the uh, same amount of data use, uh, with same amount of latency, that will cause a huge effort in the wireless channel, which is not quite beneficial. So in such a case, we probably we want to use the Li-Fi illuminators to offload some of the data that this lady, this lady want through the optical channel. Okay. So based on this uh, broad view concept, we consider two configurations. The first configuration is what we have introduced. We use a unidirectional uh, VLC uh, channel and the duplex Wi-Fi to uh, send the uplink. The second one, we assume in some case that we have a duplex VLC, and then the device can utilize two channels simultaneously to boost the data rate. And we call the second case as the aggregated system. Based on experimental results, we evaluate the average throughput for the end user when the number of user increases. First of all, let's look at what Wi-Fi only performs. 
uh, you don't need to worry that much about like the initial value, like the 36.6, uh, you may think like, why Wi-Fi is so slow? It shouldn't be that slow. Uh, the, the, the reason here is that the Wi-Fi router we connect uh, to is actually the, uh, the school uh, internet, which has a restriction on the internet port. So that's how restrict the uh, initial value. But typically a Wi-Fi router goes above 100 megabits per second has no heat problem. But the main idea here is that as the number of users increase, what happens to the Wi-Fi? Almost nothing end up with when you connect six users to it. So that's the problem of the current wireless gateway. If you connect all your devices to the Wi-Fi router, you will end up with nothing or even a disconnection for some of the devices. And then let's look at what VLC end up with. It does not change at all almost. And that's reasonable because we don't have any contention among each spot. Your laptop uses one illumination spot, uh, your refrigerator uses another illumination spot. So they don't cause any conflict. Uh, they don't cause any collision among each other. When you aggregate these two channels, you will have a boosted bandwidth. So key notes for this experimental result, the Wi-Fi performs badly for more access devices. VLC performance is stable, even though you increase the number of devices. And the aggregation boosts the data rate by combining these two channels. Now, you may think that aggregation is always better, right? Then why we still need to consider the Wi-Fi only or VLC only? We just combine all of this technology together and build a fused uh, communication system, use the Bluetooth, use ZigBee, use Wi-Fi, use everything. That will give us a, the best performance. The answer is no. Why no? Let's look at the experiment for a loading time in web browsing. We try to connect to, let's say, Yahoo, Go, Google, YouTube, Apple, using these three configurations. Of course, Wi-Fi is the worst. When you connect multiple users to the internet and test the loading time, Wi-Fi takes much longer time than the VLC. Like here, Wi-Fi takes 6.3 seconds, while VLC only takes 1.9 seconds to load the Yahoo page. But the reason why aggregation performs worse here, why aggregation performs worse than the VLC? only. The reason is that your traffic, some of them goes to the Wi-Fi, some of them goes to the VLC, but finally you need to assemble them, right? You cannot receive your wheel, your front wheel, without your frame to assemble your, bi your bicycle. You need everything to be there to finally show you the web page. So if the Wi-Fi is something that hold back your performance, then aggregating them may not give you a better, benefit, a better outcome for this type of applications. And this type of ap application is very similar to the uh, smart grid remote control because you want the real-time information from every devices. So key notes here, Wi-Fi performs the worst, VLC performs the best, and the aggregation system is held back by the high Wi-Fi latency. Now we complete everything regarding the VLC offloading system. Next, we are looking at the second benefit, secure the wireless communication. Before we look at the secure wireless communication, we first need to understand what the vulnerability currently we have. Let's say you bring a mobile phone uh, close to your Wi-Fi router. Uh, if you, it's your first time, you click on the SSID, you enter your password, you are connected to it. The second time or the third time, you might not need to enter the password. You just go close by, your mobile phone will be directly connected to the uh, Wi-Fi because the password is stored in your mobile phone. But no matter it's first time or second time or third time authentication, every time the authorized user will communicate with the authenticator which can be the Wi-Fi router, through a key exchange process. This key exchange process will involve a four-way handshake, which will create a key that encrypt the data exchange later on. 
The vulnerability of the current most commonly used encryption method. Check your home Wi-Fi, check your office Wi-Fi. They all use this WPA2 personal settings. Probably a university-wide, industrial-wide will use some other, but small unit, a small business unit, like the home office, they typically use WPA2 personal. And if they are using WPA2 personal, what happens is this key exchange can be intercepted passively by an interceptor. And then this interceptor do some uh, reverse engineering method to find out the password of your Wi-Fi and decrypt the data exchange. So finally, your data exchange between your mobile device or between your uh, other electrical consumption device and the authenticator becomes plain text to the interceptor. Next, let's use a video to show how actually your passive interceptor can steal your Wi-Fi login password. We have used this Wi-Fi router and we use this white USB device as the wireless adapter, which is actually a hacking device that passively intercept your Wi-Fi signal. And then the result will be displayed on this screen, show the captured packets and decrypted Wi-Fi password. Next, let's look at the video. Hello, this video is going to demonstrate the vulnerability of the standard security protocol for Wi-Fi routers known as WPA2. The router used needs to be compatible with this protocol. The method I'm going to use to expose this vulnerability is intercepting data that is being communicated between a device and the router. The device being used for this is a wireless adapter shown here. This device is used normally to give access to Wi-Fi to the device that is plugged into. This device has another capability, it's called monitor mode. Monitor mode allows the device to monitor the data moving over Wi-Fi. The device can be put into monitor mode with a software called aircrack-ng. Then information for all the nearby routers can be displayed. Once we have found our router and used a simple command, then we can capture the data by connecting a device to the Wi-Fi. After the device is connected, the software called Wireshark can display the authorization packets in real time. So as you can see, this phone is connecting to the router in, in real time and you can see the packets showing up in Wireshark. These lines in Wireshark will give us all of the information needed to recover the password. Then with one command, the password can be found. This is done by matching the data found with over 14 million common passwords. As you can see, the password is password. Then it can be demonstrated on another device logging into the Wi-Fi. And the password is P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D password. Joining, and we are connected. So that uh, actually see. shows us uh, so that actually shows us the vulnerability of the current Wi-Fi uh, communication. And we need to solve it, right? We are not going to connect our uh, like smart appliances to this uh, type of vulnerable. Although we can apply some other settings, for example, the radius server, we can apply WPA3, which is not a commonly used one yet they are pretty much using a remote server to do another tier authentication. But how can you prepare a remote server for every home? That becomes a question. So for the small unit, for the small energy consumption unit, probably you want to consider some other low cost and flexible solution. VLC could be this solution. How we can use VLC to do that? we exchange the sensitive data on the VLC link. For example, authentication request and response, association request and response, key management like the EAPAL messages you show, uh, we show on the Wireshark. And after we have done all this key exchange process, 
once the key is already known by the supplicants, which are the uh, mobile devices or other electrical devices, and the authenticator, which could be the Wi-Fi router, the key are known at both end or both entities. We now use the key to do the X data exchange on Wi-Fi. So the interceptor will not be able to get your key in such a way it cannot decrypt your data exchange over the radio. There are many different ways to implement such uh, like a pack, uh, traffic redirection. One way is to implement it in the data link layer using different interface. Like one interface card is used for optical communication, one interface card is used for the radio communication. And then we aggregate this traffic to the uh, network layer and upper layer, like the TCP layer, application layer. Based on this requirement, we only need to exchange the sensitive data over the VLC. Do we need a one gigabit link? Probably not, right? The sensitive data exchange probably only costs you 10K, 100 kilobits per second during that awake time. So in from this thinking logic, probably we can utilize something else other than only VLC to compromise our data rate while solving some other issues like the size, the weight, the energy consumption, the cost, all the other concerns. And also very important alignment. So based on this thinking logic, retro VLC probably will be a better solution. The left-hand side, which is the conventional uh, symmetric VLC will send a downlink from a light bulb to a light sensor, the uplink from another bulb to another light sensor. In this case, you need the very high power. You need very high power uh, at the device side. You probably need some uplink alignment because if you miss the alignment, your signal will be very bad. And you also have the potential uplink glaring because you are shooting a light from your desk to your ceiling. And also the light bulb putting on a mobile phone is very bulky. So there are some disadvantages of this uh, conventional symmetric VLC setting, but uh, it can achieve better throughput, no doubt. But do we need that? We don't in this specific application. Therefore, retro VLC, which is at the right-hand side, the ultra low power asymmetric retro VLC, will just place this retro tag, which only costs you hundreds of microwatt. You probably does not have an idea what does hundreds of microwatt mean. Your current uh, mobile phone consumes hundreds of milliwatt to transmit a signal. Your Wi-Fi router taking the heat, uh, heating effect into account will can goes up to six watt to ten watt power consumption to support the wireless communication. So you see how low the power consumption is for this retro tag. And then this retro tag will receive the downlink signal from the light bulb to a light sensor. And the important part, the new the new concept is the uplink. The uplink will be reflected by a retro reflector, similar material to the stop sign you see in the uh, in your uh, highway. It's not highway, sorry, the cross uh, the crossway. And then uh, this retro reflected material reflect the light and pass through something called LCD shutter. The LCD shutter is just a single pixel on your mobile phone screen, on your desktop screen, on your laptop screen. Your screen has so many such pixels. And we can make this pixel larger to turn on and off that selectively block and transmit the optical signal through it. And this reflected signal will be received by the uh, light sensor and finally create the duplex link. In the meantime, the light can also One second, I don't know what happens, but let me just reshare this slide. In the meantime, the LED can support 
the uh, power consumption of the retro tag by uh, providing the energy for it. So it's a uh, there are many advantages for it, like the ultra low power consumption. The uplink uh, alignment is already done because it's retro reflection reflect the light back to its source, and there is no diffused uplink reflect uh, glaring light. You are not going to look at the tag beside the light bulb. If you are if you are moving a little bit away from the light, you will not see any light from the retro reflected tag. So it's a there is no uplink glaring and it's small size and lightweight. One issue for this retro VLC is the bandwidth is limited. Two commonly used LCD shutters are currently in the market: the twisted pneumatic and the pi cell shutters. Each of them associated with different driving voltage. Uh, TN has a lower one, but lower frequency. Pi cell has a higher voltage, but higher frequency. Let's do some experiment now. We transmit the, uh, we put the LED light bulb at the one side of this uh, shutter and the shutter will turn on and off. So it becomes a signal, goes to the photodiode. And the photodiode will be connected to an oscilloscope and the signal will be displayed on the oscilloscope. And what we do in this experiment, we change the frequency of this on and off of the LCD shutter and check the frequency and uh, check the waveform on the oscilloscope. First, we check the two hertz. Two hertz give us a very nice look square wave. What happens? 10 hertz, still square wave. 40 hertz, probably not. 100 hertz, kind of a sinusoidal. 140 hertz, close to a sawtooth. 200 hertz, pretty much a sawtooth. 300 hertz, a sawtooth, and it's fluctuating. This sawtooth is not even stable. When it goes to 400, 800, 1600, you can see that not only the square wave becomes a sawtooth, the entire signal is superimposed on a low frequency signal which is something we don't want at all. We say that this signal is completely distorted and cannot be utilized unless we really figure out like the low frequency signal, how much it is. And also the signal amplitude getting much lower. So that's the, what do we mean by increasing the frequency is cannot be achieved, uh, cannot be achieved by these LCD shutters. Then based on this limitation, we propose another concept, the pixelated retro VLC tag. Instead of using one shutter, we can actually aggregate or integrate many different shutters. The ben one of the benefit is that the smaller size of the shutter will have the faster switching speed. That's a manufacturing uh, concept. When you manufacture a small LCD shutter, this capacitance, we call it junction capacitance, is less. And then your LCD shutters can turn on, on and off faster. Then when you in integrate many, many pixels, you can turn on and off each pixels individually to create a multi-level optical signal. And up on that, we can include, we can develop more advanced modulation schemes rather than just the simply on and off key. This is a current test bed that we have developed from the New Mexico tag. On the trail, we have a retro uh, VLC tag that have multiple pixels on it. You can see it's four times five, so there are 20 pixels on it. The right-hand side is the light access point. Based on some, this is currently in the preliminary setup. So based on uh, some turning on and off, we can only show currently a very low amplitude square wave signal that is reflected from the retro VLC tag showing on the uh, oscilloscope. And if you're looking into the uh, construction of the uh, retro VLC tag and the light AP, the retro VLC tag uses a microcontroller to send the digital signal to control the pixels on the retro VLC tag individually and independently. The light AP use a light source, use three light sources and an envelope photo detector to uh, send and receive the light signal. One other uh, prototype is developed by my collaborator, which is also my PhD supervisor from New Jersey Institute of Technology. This tag use the corner cube retroreflector instead of those uh, uh, retroreflecting material on the stop sign. 
The corner cube will provide stronger reflection light because it's regular shape. And it includes a solar cell to harvest the energy. And the harvested energy will drive the driver circuit and the driver circuit will turn on and off. The, uh, the LCD shutter currently is placed on top of the uh, corner cube retroreflector. So the driver circuit turn on and off these LCD shutters to send the signal up. Based on this corner cube, actually we can include something that is very interesting. The real time tracking using this retro VLC tag. Consider a light infrastructure. We include some photodiodes on top of the uh, light infrastructure and connect the photodiodes to a centralized controller. Let's say you have some devices, the mobile devices, the human wearable devices, and some uh, instrumentation devices uh, all cause some uh, electrical consumptions. You place the retro tag, the retro VLC tag on all of them. And then they will reflect the light back to the photodiodes. Based on this reflect light signal strengths, you can compute the 3D coordinates of this, all these devices in real time. And in the meantime, this retro VLC tag can send the 0101 data back to the photodiodes to enable the communication. So that's why we call it VLCP, the visible light communication and positioning system. In this positioning system, the research challenge is when the retro reflector changes its location and orientation, the received optical power on the photodiode will change. The reason why it changes is because the light from the, the light that uh, is going to be reflected back, the area, we call it effective reflecting area. From the, the light emitted from this reflecting area will finally be reflected back to the photodiode. And the interesting part is when you change the corner cube retro reflector location, the effective reflecting area will also change. So the, 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 the concept becomes how we correlate the effective reflecting area with the location of the retro reflector. The key idea of this design is that once we look at a parallel light rays in incident on the corner cube retro reflector, only partially of them will be retro reflected back. And if we look at the top view of this, uh, this cylinder structure of the light rays, they are actually an overlap area or intersection area between two circles. And the first circle is the uh, and, and these two circles are the front face of that corner cube retro reflector. So what we do, we put these two circles on top of the light source plane, which is the light source on the ceiling. And what we can do to figure out the ERA, we rotate this intersection area around the P. The P is the place of the photodiode and the P prime is the symmetric point, which will indicate the trajectory, uh, sorry, indicate the boundary of that ERA. So when we do this rotating, the P prime is the boundary of the ERA. Now let's look at how the boundary looks like. The boundary is actually the intersection of two larger circle. And we can easily use some mathematical derivation to find out the radius of these two larger circles. So finally, we characterize the relationship between the effective reflecting area and the location of the retro reflector. Based on this closed form expression, we developed a localization system and tested it using the test bed. It shows that the location error can be at centimeter level for different height. So the first uh, plot, the location error, is a centimeter level location accuracy. If we include the orientation, uh, like the azimuth angle and the elevation angle of the corner cube and the location of the corner cube, then it can achieve um, also centimeter level location error, although a little bit higher, uh, and the single digit orientation uh, error for the angle. So that concludes everything for my today's presentation. And now we enter the last part, Q&A.
Cool. Uh, thank you so much. That was really cool. Uh, I, I did not expect to one, understand it, and two, be so impressed. Um, I'm gonna give people a second to ask their questions. I know I have a few, but I'm gonna see what people, uh, if they have any questions first, and then I'll send them mine. Um, or you know what, maybe I'll just ask before because I can. All right, I have a question about, um, have you heard of information-centric networking? Yes. Okay, what are your thoughts on this technology in that space? Um, so the informational centric uh, network design is uh, completely changed the current IP-based routing concept. And it's a very network layer uh, based design. Uh, so they are, uh, so that I can say in this way, the information centric network do not really care about whether you are using radio or whether you are using optical. The uh, physical layer implementation, like what the medium is, is invisible to the decision-making at the network layer. Data, when it's reached to the decision uh, layer at the information-centric network, becomes a packet. So no matter what technology you use, it's just a packet. And the information-centric network, uh, instead of using the identity, which is the IP address of the user as to guide how these packets are going flows through the network, they use the data to do this uh, flow guidance. And unfortunately, today we don't have the expert, uh, Dr. Jen, who can give better comments on this uh, question, but that's my best understanding. On okay, I was going, I just wondering if there, I mean, because this seems like a really cool way to distribute networking load. Um, oh, and I do have questions, so I'm gonna be quiet. Dustin, go. go okay, yes. Yeah, okay. Do have a couple of Q and A questions. Uh, the first one is: What are your predictions for when VLC will move out of the lab and into real-world applications? Are there any VLC applications currently in use? So uh, there are already some uh, VLC companies. Uh, one in California, in Europe, uh, the doctor has from uh, University of Edinburgh built the. Uh, uh, very the, the first uh, VLC company called uh, Pure Li-Fi, and they all sell the VLC products to the market. We originally, back to eight years ago, we originally expect the VLC to be one mature uh, technology in 5G. Unfortunately, the optical device has a kind of high restriction on the modulation bandwidth. So currently we are turning on and off this, uh, uh, this uh, light bulb or LED emitter. This specific method kind of restrict the modulation bandwidth. And also the, you, you, we need to also answer a question. What if we do not have the light turned on, what happens? Sometimes the light is turned off we can also transmit uh, data when the light is turned off, but in a very, so very low data rate. So there is some com compromise there. So there are still many, many challenges of the uh, VLC that needs to be uh, complete resolved in order to push to the market and make it as a popular and commonly used communication technology. In almost, uh, all the prestige journal, magazine, top conferences, they all expect that higher frequency spectrum, such as VLC, will be the next uh, generation wireless communication method because this is the trend, this is the trend. But how to overcome the optical device uh, limitation and push this uh, communication technology to the real market is still an open research problem. 
Gotcha. Thank you. Um, leading into that, um, what barriers do you see to adoption in the um, greater into the technological community? It seems like this is still a very young and upcoming uh, sort of technology. What what are some of the um, bars to entry into the market? Yes, I totally agree that this is a pivot to the technology. If we look at the investment um, and the, the, the gain from the, uh, the consumer, if we look at the, 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 the company that is currently uh, in, in, in California that is selling the, uh, the light and the communication USB driver that you can plug in into your uh, mobile device and communicate with the light. The light bulb is costing you $1,700, just a single desktop light. And that USB communication unit costs you another thousand. Um, Still, currently, I do not have a clear answer how to make this uh, like revenue happens in a smart way to, to push this technology in the market. Something unfortunate for the VLC researcher is that millimeter wave is too strong. That's why in the 5G communication, people rather than looking at like the even higher frequency, like terahertz, they look at the millimeter wave first something between six gigahertz and a terahertz. So millimeter wave becomes the, uh, the hottest research topic in 5G, uh, but we definitely expect that VLC is the next step after the millimeter wave, because currently based on the uh, high level view of all the wireless access, access, uh, access technologies in order to accommodate, uh, in order to satisfy all the specifications in the uh, 6G standard. Although it's currently still under development, uh, but there's some specification there in order to satisfy all those specifications. Uh, it seems that there's no other options. Thank you. I don't think we have any other questions at this time. Okay, um, so I, I'm still grasping uh, this concept, and I think I'll close this out. But like in my in my mind, I see this as like a Pentagon thing where they go into a room and turn on a special light, and then they have their encrypted conversation that no one else can can influence. Is that is that even like semi realistic? No, maybe. You 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 are asking my question. Yeah, I could could this be? I wonder if this could be implemented as a defense technology. Um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, not really a question, just kind of a comment and observation. Um, I'm going to there, going to close us out. Uh, I wanted to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shaw, once more for being so generous with your time and expertise on behalf of everyone who is part of the New Mexico's Market Project. Thank you. And uh, before we sign off, I also want to thank my partner in crime, Dustin Allen. And don't forget to visit our webpage and read the monthly newsletter to find out what great webinars and opportunities we're hosting next. Uh, see you all in 2022. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you also, Brittany.